Although I retired from a company called USAA in San Antonio, um, prior to that, I worked at Halliburton under Dick Cheney and had international operations in 54 countries. And uh, although I did work under Dick Cheney, I never hunted lawyers with him. Some of you all remember, he actually shot a lawyer once. Okay. Um, but in doing that, uh, he had me leading a lot of the big negotiations around the Middle East particularly. And at one point, I was in Algeria negotiating a, a large contract, the first big international deal that we got when he became CEO. And I was in this compound, and if any of you have seen the movie 13 Hours, where the terrorists start collecting outside the compound, uh, that happened. We had a helicopter with two pilots that were going to fly me out. They shot down the helicopter, killed the two pilots. We had a, a bus of 48 oil workers. They pulled over the bus and slit the throats of 46 of, 40, of 48 of our, our workers. And so they start collecting on the outside. And thankfully, uh, with a matter of a couple of hours, the military from Algeria came and rescued us, uh, unlike they did in Benghazi, and that's for another time. But as they took us out of this gate, there were hundreds of men standing outside of this gate, and all of us have had somebody maybe didn't like us very well, or maybe even hated us. Well, when you see hundreds of Muslims standing outside the gate, looking at you because they want to kill you, and the reason they wanted to kill me, because a note came over the wall in this compound, is they wanted to kill me because only because I was a Christian. And that kind of makes it real. So uh, yesterday at Ohio Christian University, I asked these two um, illustrious men to come and speak to the students on Islam, and I thought you would benefit from some of this. The man sitting to my, first man sitting to my left is Robert Spencer, He's the director of Jihad Watch, a program of David Horowitz Freedom Center, and the author of 15 books. One of them is The Complete Guide, The Complete Infidel's Guide to the Koran, and we have a small number of those. If you'd like to buy it after, when we take a break in the room back there, he'll autograph one, and you can buy it for a, a relatively inexpensive price. Um, one of the, his bestsellers was The Truth About Muhammad, uh, the politically, and this is how I, I got introduced to him and Sean Hannity, the politically incorrect guide to Islam, and President Obama listed up, and the Crusades. His latest book is The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS, and coming out later this year is The Complete Infidel's Guide to Iran. Uh, Robert has led seminars on Islam and Jihad for the FBI, the United States Central Command, the United States Army Command, the General Staff College, the U.S. Army's Asymmetrical Warfare Group, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and a whole bunch of other uh, security and military groups. But since President Obama uh, became president, um, they don't ask him anymore. wonder why. Um, but of great importance, Robert has appeared on the Faith and Liberty talk show three times and just recently, yesterday, appeared again. He's been on Sean Hannity. Many of you may have seen him debating um, imams and other um, prominent Muslims, Fox News, CBN, and a bunch of others. Then on my far left here is Samuel Whitefield. He's a pastor, teacher, and writer. He serves on the senior leadership team of the International House of Prayer of Kansas City and teaches at the International House of Prayer University. He too is a national expert on the threat of Islam and is well versed in the threat to Israel and Christians. He writes extensively at his website, SamuelWhitefield.com. Uh, Samuel also directs a ministry called One King, and One King hosts intensives for young adults in Israel and other locations and is actively involved in the ministry in the Middle East. So, Robert, let's just start off with you with the elephant in the room. Um, is Islam a religion of peace as President Obama, President George Bush, the media, academia, and even some prominent men of faith say? Well, you would think with that kind of consensus that Islam would have to be a religion of peace because how could all those people be wrong? But unfortunately, it's rather obvious that they are. They have to keep telling us that Islam is a religion of peace because of the evidence of our eyes when we see the daily headlines, makes it so obvious that Islam is not 
a religion of peace. Islam is, as a matter of fact, the only religion that has a developed doctrine and theology and legal system that mandates, commands warfare against unbelievers. And the Quran says very specifically in chapter 9, verse 29, if you'd like to open your Qurans there to uh, <laughs> chapter 9, verse 29, you'll see that it says, fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not believe in the last day, even if they are of the people of the book. Now, that's very important because the people of the book is the Quran's term for primarily Jews and Christians. So in other words, it's a specific command to fight against Jews and Christians. And then it goes on to say, until they pay the jizya, which is a tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So Muslims have a divine command as they see it in the book that they believe was written by Allah himself, the, who they think is the only and supreme God. And it, the divine command is to wage war against Christians until we submit to the hegemony and overlordship of the Muslims and accept a humiliating and degrading second class status. That is not con uh, a part of a religion, the, the, the version of Islam that's twisted and hijacked by a tiny minority of extremists. It's the Quran, the holy book itself. There are many other passages like it. There are also many other echoes of it in the statements of Muhammad, and Muhammad's statements are normative for Islamic behavior because he's called the excellent example of conduct in the Quran. And so it is mainstream Islam to wage war against, conquer, and subjugate Christians. And when the Muslims do that, as they are persecuting Christians all over the Middle East today, they believe that they are serving God. And so in a certain sense, it is a fulfillment of Jesus' words in the Gospel of John when he said, the time will come when men will kill you and think they are offering service to God. That time is upon us now. Wow, good, good points. Um, Samuel, um, what's the difference, the major differences between Islam and Christianity? Well, of course, there's a, a huge number of, of differences, but I think the easiest way for us to, to see a very distinct difference between Islam and Christianity is to bring up the issue of Jesus. Y you know, one of the unique things about Islam is it is the only major world religion that is essentially an answer or an argument to another religion, right? You know, maybe if you talk to a Hinduist or a Buddhist, their, their worldview is completely different from ours, but when you look at what are the core tenets of Islam, the, temi t the tenets are very simple. God can't have a son, and for any man to, to present himself as equal to God is the unforgivable sin, which is, which is a challenge that Muslims face when we give them the gospel. They've been taught that the only unforgivable sin is to give Allah a partner or someone of, uh, of equal, uh, equal to himself. So it really comes down to the issue of Jesus. We would say issue, that, that Jesus died and rose from the dead. They would say he didn't die because Allah would not allow him to be humiliated that way. We would say that Jesus is God, that, that, that being the son of God makes him unique. They would say, no, that's not true. We would say we need the shed blood of Jesus to cover our sin, to provide atonement. They would say, no, it's, it's up to you and your works. If you do more good than bad, then Allah will let you through. So uh, again, we could, we could go on for hours about the uh, small differences and big differences, but essentially, if you're in a conversation with a Muslim, the fastest way to get to the difference is to bring up the issue of Jesus. Because even though the Quran says certain things, it calls him the word of God, says he's sinless, things like that, uh, the Quran is also very clear that he's not God, that, that he did not die and suffer for our sins and things like that. So I think it's that person of Jesus, to me, is the most distinctive issue and the best starting place to see how very different these two uh, religions are. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, is Islam, Robert, a direct threat to the U.S.? Islam is certainly a direct threat to the U.S. Islam denies the freedom of speech, which is the cornerstone of any free society. If uh, there is no freedom of speech, then a tyrant can work his will unopposed and unimpeded. And it denies the freedom of conscience, which is uh, something that we take for granted in the United States, that if somebody comes in conscience to an understanding of the truth that is different from what he has, then he can convert 
and change his understanding. And of course, that's a foundational, under, a foundational idea for us in the church in doing evangelism, that we're trying to make people change their minds. But in Islam, Muhammad said, if anybody changes his religion, kill him. And it's illegal for Christians in Muslim countries all over the world to preach the gospel to non-Muslims. They'll be killed if they try, which is not to say they shouldn't try and there are ways to do it. But it's a very dangerous thing to do, more dangerous than it is in other parts of the world. The Quran and Islam in general, they deny the equality of rights of women before the law and uh, deny women basic rights. Their inheritance rights are diminished. Their right to testify in court is diminished. Islam allows for polygamy, which makes women into commodities, as well as the sexual slavery of infidel women. It's a very unpleasant subject, but it's all sanctioned in the Quran. What we see ISIS doing and kidnapping Yazidi and Christian women and using them in this way, uh, these things it also denies the equality of rights of non-Muslims. And uh, if, if there are large numbers of Muslims in the United States, because they believe that all of this is the law of Allah, we would start to see it here. And we will start to see it here because, of course, the president is importing large numbers of Muslims into the United States now. And in the coming years, he plans to import more. The other problem, the other aspect of this problem is that ISIS, or the Islamic State, or ISIL, as the president calls them, is a very significant force that controls a territory larger than Great Britain and receives billions of dollars on a regular basis for the sale of black market oil. Nobody is in a position to take it out. Those who can destroy it will not, and those who would want to destroy it cannot. It's going to be there for a while, and they have explicitly declared war on the United States, and they have sent people over here with explicit instructions about how to blend into the larger community, even at times to pose as Christians, until such time as they're called upon to strike. And so they are not, probably not going to be able to destroy the United States, but their plan is to overwhelm our law enforcement and intelligence apparatus with so many attacks and so many plots that the, that the uh, P police and law enforcement and intel just simply collapses under the weight of all this and then of course they can take advantage of the ensuing chaos. But I thought the administration said they could vet those people coming in. <laughs> the thing is there's just absolutely no way, it's not even possible to vet. Tashfin Malik, one of the San Bernardino killers who killed 14 people at a Christmas party in San Bernardino, California on December 2nd, she had passed five separate background checks from five different US government agencies to get into the United States. Now, it's not that those agencies were all incompetent. The thing is, is that the only thing they can track for is criminal activity. That if somebody's been arrested for something or been identified as a member of a terror group, then they can be vetted. The problem is that ISIS, in particular, has instructed its recruiters to find people who have no record. And so there's just absolutely nothing to go on to vet them. And it's not as if they're wearing signs that say, I'm a jihad killer to be. So there's no, absolutely no way to tell, especially in light of the fact that ISIS has instructed them not to carry Qurans, not to wear beards, not to wear kaftans, not to go to mosque, but to look as if they are exactly what Obama wants so much of in the United States, moderate, peaceful, secularized Muslims. The problem is a moderate, peaceful, secularized Muslim, if he believes in the teachings of the Quran and Muhammad, can wage jihad at any point. Well, doesn't that make ISIS actually more true Muslims? Oh, absolutely. ISIS is much truer in terms of uh, being faithful to Islam than moderate Muslims. Uh, ISIS, the Quran says, when you meet the unbelievers, strike their necks. You can find that in chapter 47, verse 4. ISIS does the beheading videos. It says you can take up to four wives and the captives of the right hand who are these infidel women who are used as sex slaves. It's in the Quran in chapter 4 verse 3, 424, 23, 1 to 6, 33, 50, 70, 30. In other words, it's very commonly repeated and ISIS does that. Other Muslim groups don't. They're so, they say, make the Christians pay this tax and submit to the Muslims mm -hmm. and they're collecting it from the remaining Christians in their domains. The moderate Muslims in the United States obviously say they reject that, but the, the ISIS people are the ones who are being true to what's in the Quran. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, just, just like Robert said, is, you know, frequently we see 
the, the short horrors of what ISIS is doing, but, but when you see some of the longer videos, some of the longer things, you'll see that they give a very detailed theological justification for everything that they do. Uh -huh. you, you know, that, that they are pulling on the, the Quran, the traditions of the early Muslims, things like that, for the justification of what they do. It, it's in, intensely theological. And in fact, ISIS, you know, just in, in my opinion, would be the closest thing to how early Islam is depicted that we've probably seen on the earth in, in several centuries. And this is actually causing a challenge in the West because, you know, in the West, we've kind of, the last centuries have had this value of tolerance, right, that, that all, relig all religions are kind of either equally bad, if we're an atheist, or equally good, you know, and we just respect each other. And we have an inability to see that some things are intrinsically evil. And in fact, what ISIS is demonstrating is that Islam itself is intrinsically evil. They are being faithful to the example of Muhammad, the traditions, the Hadiths of Muhammad, and to what the Quran says. But, but it's hard for us to struggle with that because we kind of, well, what's tolerance? You know, every mm -hmm. religion's got a little bit of good in it, but the reality is ISIS is actually demonstrating a true orthodox Islam. You know, a friend of mine said that, uh, when, when, when ISIS declared the, the, the caliphate or the caliph, it was kind of a Martin Luther moment for Islam. In other words, it was a calling back. Martin Luther King moment. No, I'm thinking of Martin Luther, the, the Protestant okay, reformer, the, when he kind of, okay. he puts the things on the wall and he's, he's, you know, if you're in a Protestant tradition, he's trying to correct some abuses of the church and call it back oh, to, I see. you know, back, you know, at the time, of course, he wasn't trying to leave the church. He was trying to correct some abuses. In other words, the caliph, when he was declared, ISIS was going, we need to restore a pure <coughs> Islam based on what the text says, and, and they're actually trying to be faithful and true mm -hmm. to what the text says. Well, both of you, you and I, we've talked about the lying that is subscribed in the Quran. Would one of you talk about lying and as it's um, sanctioned? Chapter 3, verse 28 of the Quran says, do not let, un do not take unbelievers as your friends and protectors in preference to believers. Whoever does this has nothing to do with Allah unless you are doing it to guard yourselves against them. Now that, what does that mean? What does it mean to guard yourselves against them? And how would that take the form of pretending to be the friend of unbelievers? You go to the commentaries on the Quran and they're just like their commentaries on the Bible. There are Islamic scholars, some of whom go back hundreds of years and their commentaries are very respected who've written explanations of the Quran. One of the most prominent of these and mainstream of these was written by a scholar in the 14th century named Ibn Kathir. But if you go to your local Islamic bookstore, which I'm not sure would be a great idea, but if you were to go to your local Islamic bookstore, you would find Ibn Kathir's commentary on the Quran. I guarantee it. It's very mainstream. And in it, it says, he quotes one of Muhammad's earliest followers saying, this means behind the, behind the backs of some people, we curse them, but we smile in their faces. And you do that in order to gain an advantage over the unbelievers when you're considered to be in a state of war against them. Muhammad said, war is deceit, and he allowed for lying in wartime. And when you understand that groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the other jihad groups do consider themselves to be at war with the United States, then things begin to come clearer when you see these uh, 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 apparently moderate Muslim organizations in the United States, like the Council on American Islamic Relations, and they have ties to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood, and they say Islam is a religion of peace, they know better because they're tied into groups that are acting as if it's not a religion of peace. But what mm -hmm. they're doing is trying to lull Americans into complacency based on ignorance and make us think, well, there's not really a problem because Islam is a religion of peace. There's just a tiny minority of extremists we have to worry about, and they want to obscure the fact that it's mainstream Islamic teaching that they have to wage war against unbelievers. Well, an example of that, you were on Sean Hannity's show, and you pointed out over the objections, and, I, and I'll have trouble pronouncing it, Imam Muhammad Ali Alahi from the House of Stupidity, oh no, the House of Wisdom, that the mosques all across America were actively teaching Muslims that Sharia law should replace constitutional law and that Americans should be prosecuted Against, speaking against Islam. What's it say about Muslims who speak openly in America? Well, see, 80%, there have been four separate studies of mosques in the United States since 1998. 
These were separate and independent studies. They all were done by different people. They had nothing to do with one another. But they all came to the same conclusion, that 80% of mosques in the United States, including notably a very notorious mosque in Columbus, Ohio, teach that the Muslims have the responsibility ultimately to replace the U.S. Constitution with Islamic law. And they teach hatred of Jews and Christians and so on. But then Islamic spokesmen like this fellow on Hannity come out and say, no, 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 Muslims don't want Islamic law here and are perfectly loyal citizens. This would be great, except his evidence is anecdotal. He's really just speaking for himself. The, what has been found in these studies shows that, oh yeah, that the vast majority of the mosques are teaching what is what used to be known as sedition and treason and ought to be prosecuted as such today. But what about where we've seen some big churches that invite some imam in to speak and they say wonderful things and even some of the, the pastors have commented, see, Islam is a religion of peace. Well, you know, you, they have to keep saying it, they have to keep repeating it because, as I said, it's so obviously false. And a lot of the, all over the country, churches hold these programs, especially liberal churches, hold these programs where they bring in an imam and he says, I'm going to clear up some misconceptions about Islam. And you see, Islam doesn't really teach violence against unbelievers and they're twisting and hijacking the teachings. But then you've got to wonder, why, if that's true, are Muslims around the world so signally failing to teach their people their own religion? Why, if that were true, are Muslims not able to communicate the genuine teachings of Islam to young Muslims? Why do they keep joining? 30,000 foreign Muslims from all around the world have gone to Iraq and Syria from 100 countries to fight alongside ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And they do that because they think these people represent real Islam. So what these imams would have us believe is that they teach peace and love and harmony in their mosques, and then somehow these guys go on the internet and they read some other version of Islam, and they immediately fall for it. Well, why is the true version of Islam that's supposedly peaceful so weak that it can't withstand the challenge from this supposedly falsified version? It just doesn't make any sense. And yet, churches all over the country, they routinely fall for this, and here again, it fosters their ignorance and complacency. You, you know, one thing related to that point that might, because a lot of times uh, talking about this, people go, I've never even heard about Islam. I'm kind of scared. I'm trying to get my head around it. Well, one thing that kind of maybe helps, helps you understand it is, you know, usually when we think I'm a Christian and then there's the, and I kind of, in a way, I separate that from my government, meaning that I don't expect everything the American government to do to be ordained by God. My biblical principles, right, influence how we vote, how we make laws, how we govern, but I would never think that the law that got declared last year is, is therefore a divine law. But within, and so we, in, in, a, in a way, kind of separate state and religion, a, a bit, I know it's a, it's a loaded phrase, but in a way we see them distinctly, though, though obviously our faith influences how, how we uh, act and behave and form laws. In Islam, there's not that same level of separation. Islam is more of a total worldview, a total life system. Meaning it's not just, I have a religion, and the morals of that religion influence. No, I have a religion with a law code, with a way of life, with a person that I'm to imitate in every way. So we would imitate the nature and character of Jesus. They would imitate everything Muhammad does. So he prefers a side of his body. Then they prefer that side of their body. And it, it goes in deep and intricate detail. So think about you bring a Muslim into America, and we're thinking, okay, he's got a religion we disagree with, but we can still operate in the framework that we're used to in America. But the truth is, as a good Muslim, he has an obligation to live out every sphere of his life in obedience to Islam, including the Sharia, the law codes. Right? And so we be, for us to be obedient to Jesus, it affects what we do. We preach the gospel. It affects what we do. For them to be obedient, they need to implement a total life <coughs> and world system. And it, it, was, it was funny. A friend of mine was actually a evangelizing with a Muslim who was actually trying to evangelize him. The, the phrase is called doing dawah when they're trying to call us to Islam. And he was saying this, relig Islam's religion of peace, religion of peace. And, and my friend had been studying Islam a little bit, so he kept pushing him and he said, what do you mean, what do you mean when you say Islam's religion of peace? Because when someone tells me it's peace, we have a certain mm -hmm. idea. And he said, well, peace is when the Sharia comes. And he says, until the Sharia comes, there is not peace. And he was even, they poked him further, and he was going, you even sometimes have to do unpeaceful things to bring the peace of the Sharia. 
So again, it's helpful to think when, when you're thinking as a Muslim obedience to Islam, you're not just thinking I go to the mosque or go to the church, and that affects how I relate, but those are different realms of activity. You're thinking I've got to bring everything I do in subjection to Allah. He's given me a divine law code. If, if the nation I'm in is not obeying that law code, we need to get it to obey that law code. So those kind of things, actually, they approach things very differently than we do even in their worldview and their thinking. Well, let's talk a little bit about the end game. Um, I saw a photo with someone in London holding up a sign, and it said, um, my religion today, your religion tomorrow. What is Islam's end game? Well, I mean, I Islam's game, uh, end game stated quite simply is, is the ultimate cause is to bring all the earth into subjection to Allah, to, to Islamize the whole earth. There's, in the same way you and I have a call to preach the gospel to all nations, they have a call to not only preach Islam or do dawah, but then even go beyond it and bring the earth ultimately under sub subjection uh, to Islam. It's, it's interesting you brought up uh, Britain, like the, the, uh, a friend of mine who's British, you know, from England, just a few years ago, his father goes down to the store and he's interacting with the shopkeeper who's, who's Muslim and the shopkeeper's complaining about the weather because, you know, England's kind of the beautiful island with lousy weather, you know. And, and the shopkeeper was, was a Muslim who had immigrated, I think, from Pakistan or somewhere like that. And he kind of said, and he was just complaining so much that, that my friend's father said, well, hey, if you don't like it here so much, why not move to Pakistan or so like, and he wasn't being nasty. He was just going, why not live somewhere you enjoy living? And he said, oh no. He said, it's not we who are leaving, it's you. And, but because again, because the idea is to expand the realm of Islam and it, it, you can even look and you'll see some protests, particularly in England, where there's a, where they are protesting the very act of democracy and voting. Why? Because voting in, in his Islamic thought is a statement that as human beings, we, we should pick our laws, we should pick our leaders. And that's an anathema in Islam because God or Allah has given us a law code. So they actually protest even the act of voting because I'm putting my will above Allah. I'm assuming that I know who to pick and what laws to make when he's already given us a code and we only need to enforce it. Mm -hmm. um, what is the... Um what does Islam teach about the end times that's relevant today, particularly related to ISIS? ISIS uh, hopes to bring about the end of the world in 10 years. And I don't know that they're going to be able to do that, but I do think it's likely that they will kill a lot of people while trying. The way it works is this. There is a prophecy attributed to Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and he says that there will be a great final battle, like the showdown at Armageddon, only in the Islamic context, it takes place in a town in northern Syria called Dabik. And the Islamic State, or ISIS, they take this so seriously that they put out a very glossy and slick monthly magazine, and it's called Dabik, after this town. It's a real town in northern Syria. It's only about 3,000 people who live there, and it is under the control of the Islamic State. And the prophecy was that at the end of the world, or just to trigger the end of the world, to trigger the end times, that there, the non-Muslims will gather at Dabik and fight the Muslims. And so what the Islamic State is trying to do over the next 10 years is provoke the United States into invading, that they will keep mounting terror attacks here, keep killing American soldiers and American civilians, until finally we've had enough the idea goes, and in 10 years, I, I, I actually hope it doesn't take that long, but in 10 years, we're supposed to go to Syria and fight them at Dabak. And then the other Islamic prophecies of the end times, they think will be triggered. In the Islamic view, Jesus is not the son of God, not the savior of the world, did not die on a cross, did not resurrect, and he is only a Muslim prophet who prophesied the coming of Muhammad, but he will return at the end of the world. When he returns at the end of the world, he is actually, in the Islamic view, very much like the Antichrist in Revelation, because he will make war on Christianity. Muhammad said that Jesus will come back and break all crosses, and he will break all the crosses because Jesus was not crucified. It's considered to be an insult to Islam that a prophet could have suffered a defeat of that kind. And so he will break the crosses, in other words, destroy Christianity, 
kill the pigs, in other words, make the Christians hold to the food laws in Islam that forbid the eating of pork, and abolish the jizya, that is the tax that the Christians have to pay when they submit to the Muslim rule, because there'll be no more submitting. At the end of the world, it will be you're either Muslim or dead. And so Jesus is going to bring this about in the Islamic worldview, and he's going to bring this about after the Muslims defeat the non-Muslim forces in the Battle of Dabak, which the Islamic State plans to have happen by the year 2025. They don't have any prophecy about a President Trump, do they? <laughs> uh, never mind. That's for another time. Um, an another thing that kind of jumps out at me is the administration um, doesn't want to recognize any of the things you guys have been saying. Why do you think that is? What's their motivation? What's the logic? I mean, they don't want you to talk to the military anymore, so they, they must have a, uh, an interest. Yeah, and of course, that, that's a... I would say a very complicated question only because I think there's multiple layers. So for example, in, in some cases, there's a genuine blindness, a refusal to see Islam for what it is. In other cases, there's uh, the geopolitical realities, meaning we don't want to offend certain Muslim groups, we don't want to offend certain Muslim governments because we want to do alliances, we want to do things like that. So we uh, back off from, from saying certain things that we should say. In other cases, there are Muslims in positions of authority and, and in power, so, so certain things don't want to be said or don't want to be acknowledged or don't want to be uh, recognized. Uh, I like to bring up there's also, a uh, again, the thing I mentioned before, there's a bigger cultural issue where we as a culture are refusing to identify the fact mm -hmm. that some religious ideas are intrinsically evil and some aren't, and that is actually a test uh, that is that is testing the very foundation of Western culture because there's a number of reasons the, the government officials are taking the stand they're taking, but then you see, for example, liberal journalists, right? And you think, what could be more opposite than liberal secularism and radical Islam? And yet that reporter, that spokesperson, finds it themselves unable to say, wow, this is Islamic. It's, well, it's extremist <laughs> or it's radical. It, it couldn't actually be Islamic. There is, there's actually a weakness in our Western culture, our Western worldview, where we refuse to say some things are right and some things are evil. Mm. And that gives us a grid to, and the reason we refuse to say that is because then we have to say, actually, the Bible might be right. And if the Bible's right, that means I have to live certain ways I don't want to live. Therefore, we're just going to say everything's okay. But then what happens with Islam? And, and it's actually, uh, I would say ludicrous, but it's not funny at all. It, it is ludicrous. How, how we are actually ignoring it, y you know? And, and in many cases, we're walking around talking about Bonhoeffer, we're reading the Bonhoeffer books, we're talking even sometimes about Lutheran Christians. Niemöller, you know, sure. Mm -hmm. Why could they not see this? But if you just look a little bit, you can easily find a movement in the nation saying far worse things than the crazy Austrian ever did in Europe. And, and the world seems unable to, or unwilling would be the other part, to recognize it and deal with it. It does provoke fear. And in fact, the Quran says, strike fear in the heart of the infidel. But the reality is the gospel liberates us from fear. And so we have to take that prophetic spirit and begin to call our culture to recognize some things are evil, some things are wrong. The president said very recently, speaking at a mosque in Baltimore, that he was not going to ever call it Islamic terrorism because ISIS and, or ISIL as he calls them, and Al-Qaeda and the rest of them, they call themselves Islamic, but they're not really Islamic. And if he called them Islamic, it would be validating them. It would be giving them authority and a uh, validation that they wouldn't otherwise have. Now let me ask you this, as Christians, how many times do you look to a Muslim head of state, say the supreme leader of Iran, to tell you what Christianity is and what, it, what Christianity isn't? You don't, you, that would be ludicrous, that would be absurd. And it's just as absurd for the President of the United States who says that he's a Christian to claim that Muslims are paying any attention whatsoever to what he calls Islamic and what he calls not Islamic. He's only just hamstringing our effort to deal with this threat by make, taking away the ability of our government and law enforcement and intelligence agencies to understand the motives and goals of the enemy. You cannot possibly defeat an enemy that you do not understand. That's an adage as old as warfare. And yet, you know, Dave has alluded to the fact that I used to be an FBI trainer and I am no longer. 
And that actually happened on October 19th, 2011, when 57 Muslim and South Asian organizations wrote to John Brennan, who was then the uh, Obama administration's Homeland Security czar and is now the head of the CIA and is widely rumored to have converted to Islam while he was serving in Saudi Arabia. And they wrote to Brennan and they said, you've got to get rid of Spencer as a trainer because he talks about Islam in connection with terrorism. Now, isn't that a terrible thing? But the fact is that Brennan immediately wrote back on White House stationery as if to emphasize how important this was to him and said that he would comply and not only would he comply with that, but he would re-educate all the agents who were trained by me and by others like me, and would make sure that every mention of Islam was removed from counter-terror training materials. So that means when you go into the FBI and you're learning about terrorism, they don't tell you the slightest thing about Islam. You learn about right-wing extremists and anti-government militias and that kind of thing. In other words, Americans. You don't learn about Islamic Jihad terrorists. And so our agents are, unless they learn on their own, and many have, but if you, the agents just follow out the training mandated by the U.S. government, they have no idea of the threat that we face. And that only makes us infinitely more vulnerable. Uh, one of the other things that a lot of Americans ask, what is the attraction to Islam that we're seeing young men want to leave the U.S. or Europe or others, and go to fight with ISIS. What's the attraction here? Yeah, I mean, th there's, <clears throat> there's a number of attractions. And in, in many cases, a lot of these young men come from Muslim backgrounds, just, uh, you, you know, we would call them kind of black backslidden. And so it's, it's a natural thing to call them back to their faith. But there's, th there's many things. There's, when they look around, they often see the bankruptcy of, of Western culture and so they in secularism and they're looking for something bigger than themselves they're looking for a a brotherhood a noble cause you know in in some cases there's uh, a deep guilt and a desire to attain heaven and escape sin I mean in Islam the only way to be guaranteed of salvation is to die in the course of battle and so we sometimes look and go why would a 22 year old mm -hmm. with his whole future ahead of him why would he run to explode himself. That makes no sense to us at all. And in, in, unless you realize he just picked the only path that guaranteed him. He could live another 40, 50 years, but maybe his good deeds and bad deeds don't quite add up on that day. So in Islamic thinking, there's, there's a desire to be cleansed of sins and, and appeal to heaven. And it's so interesting that you see so many even are radicalized so quickly. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a whole other probably conversation, but for example, when you look at the t uh, terror attacks in Paris and you start looking at some of the individuals, you look at the girl that got, implement, uh, uh, that got involved and you realize a year ago she's not observant and now she's radical. A year ago she's getting kicked out of a nightclub in Germany and now she's willing to, to blow herself up. And you realize there's a strong appeal to something bigger than myself a community of, of brothers that are pursuing something else, a longing to have my sins covered and, and forgiven. And masculinity. And, and there's a, there's a, there is a rugged, more masculinity of fighting for something rather than just consuming. And I would say those are actually things that the gospel is called to answer in, in the heart of men. So you have all of those things. And then, of course, you have some of the, quite honestly, the, the baser and more wicked instincts of men, meaning the desire to go do war and seize the, the sex slaves and do the violence. Mm -hmm. That also has a dark negative. And you can even see in some of the particular ISIS fighters, this kind of thuggery gang mm -hmm. thing that Darkness. It, it's kind of like a video game, but real. They'll post videos of them in these mansions that they've seized, driving trucks around with big guns. And it's kind of this violent thing that actually appeals to some of the, you know, darker mm -hmm. desires and longings. There is one other thing that I think pertinent in light of a lot of the uh, daily headlines that we see nowadays with the hundreds of thousands of Muslim migrants coming into Europe and Obama's plan to bring significant numbers of them here to the United States. Uh, Samuel is absolutely right that the Quran does not offer salvation. It only says if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you'll go to paradise, and if your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you'll go to hell. And then paradise is guaranteed, as Samuel said, to those who kill and are killed. This is chapter 9, verse 111 of the Quran. 
It says, paradise is guaranteed to those who kill and are killed for Allah, which is why we see the suicide bombers killing themselves in a crowd of infidels, then they know they're guaranteed paradise. But there's one other passage in the Quran that also guarantees paradise. It says that paradise is then incumbent upon Allah to grant to someone. And that's chapter 4, verse 100, which says that if you emigrate in the cause of Allah, if you leave your home and go to a new land to conquer and Islamize the new land, and if you die in the new land, then you will go to paradise. And I think that that cannot be discounted as part of what's going on with the migrants. Uh, a few years back, there was a big controversy in Minnesota over a public school that was really a Muslim school and was having Muslim prayers during the school hours. And it was called Tariq Ibn Zayed Academy. And in all the controversy over this school, I never saw anybody in the media show any curiosity about who was Tariq Ibn Zayed. Why are they naming the school after him? Was he some great Muslim educator? He was not. He was actually a general who was one of the conquerors of Muslim Spain and was famous for landing in boats on the beach in Spain and ordering the boats burned. And they said, why are you burning the boats? And he said, because we're going to stand here or die. We're going to conquer this land for Islam or we're going to be killed, but we're going to die here. Now imagine, what is the idea of naming a school in Minnesota after a man like that? Unless maybe the same idea prevails. Conquer here or die here. But they're not leaving. Well, let's move on a little positive note because you're making me sad. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I expressed to both of you guys the last couple of days is all of my dealings with um, people in Algeria, Tunisia, Syria, and other countries, every Muslim business person and client that I had always wanted to talk about Christianity again and again. And sometimes I'd even, I, let's talk about business. No, they wanted to talk about Christianity. What, where does, what does that have to do with the opportunity that we have to bring Christ to these folks? Yeah, we, up to this point, we've kind of talked, and you may be going, okay, I'm scared, I'm terrified. <laughs> You, you know, and, and the, re the, the reality is Islam does provoke fear. It says strike fear in the heart of the infinite. There's a spiritual dynamic that's connected to fear. But I love what you brought up, which is the scripture is very clear that the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. And he actually delivered us from fear. So on one hand, we can say, man, politically, nationally, this is a huge challenge. On the other hand, I would say the Lord actually calls us and said, there will be times when you will be like sheep among wolves. And we get an opportunity to actually deliver the gospel. At the end of the day, the Apostle Paul uh, wasn't quite ISIS, but, but he, he was on the wrong side of the equation, actually wanting to persecute believers, and the Lord touched him on the road to Damascus, actually, mm -hmm. you know, in Syria. Syria. <laughs> I, it, but what Dave said is so true. We sometimes think it's awkward to get in a conversation about our faith because of secularism and, and atheism and some of the... Uh, the ways the atmosphere in our country has shifted, we, you know, religion is something we don't talk about. Muslims love to talk about it. And I would say we are not given to a spirit of fear, and let's take that opportunity and jump in the conversation. Because they want to talk about they it. They want to talk about it. And you know what? It, we can talk about the beauty of Jesus, and if they push us on something we don't know, we can just go, you know what? I don't know. I'm going to find out. Like, we don't have to be in, intimidated. And even in the, the migration and all those things, that there's negative dimensions, but we can also say we actually have an opportunity now to speak the gospel to people we could not have reached before. I, you know, we can't go to Syria right now, but I might find a Syrian in, in my city, and I can actually now deliver the gospel mm -hmm. and speak to them with no threat to them or me, which is not true right. in their home context. And they are usually energized by the conversation. And while some of them, like Robert pointed out, there's a very dark dimension, there's also a dimension of some Muslims getting disillusioned right now by ISIS by going, I was taught Islam was true, and now the problem is they're doing everything, and the books, the verses line up, what do I do? There's actually some disillusionment even happening where we can give them the gospel. Robert, real quick, we're just about out of time, and Tim is looking antsy at me. Uh, the thing that you shared with the students at um, the university yesterday at OCU, the question that you can ask Muslims that they don't have an answer for, could you kind of outline that real quickly for Absolutely. the folks? The Quran says Jesus is the word of God. The Quran says that uh, Jesus is born of a virgin. Islamic tradition says that Jesus will come back at the end of the world, certainly as I explained before, not as we understand him to be coming back, but still. 
Jesus is coming back, not Muhammad. And the and Islamic tradition also holds that Jesus is sinless, not Muhammad, although in practice Muhammad is considered sinless. In the Quran, he's rebuked for sin. And so you have those four things, and there are others as well, where Jesus has a particular distinction that Muhammad does not have. And there's no explanation for this, these special qualities of Jesus in Islamic theology. They do not have any reason why Jesus would be singled out in this way and not Muhammad. And so that is something that uh, Christian preachers and evangelists and missionaries have made use of uh, for centuries in trying to plant a seed in Muslims' mind and just ask them, why is it that Jesus is favored in this way and Muhammad is not? And even the Quran bears witness to it. And many, many Muslims have converted to Christianity when they start to consider that and then to consider its implications and then to read the New Testament as a clue to what exactly it could all mean.